God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level, or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget. Web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. K98talk.com, a leader in Internet radio. So grab your seatbelts and take the ride of your life on K98talk.com. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. Again, I just want to praise the Lord and for this opportunity and, and thank the management of K98Talk.com for this great opportunity to share with you what God has done in creating me the new heart and life and changing my heart and life. And I want every one of you that listened to this this morning to maybe receive the same opportunity. But God is getting such a bum rap in our society by the different things that are being taught with a couple of hundred, you know, uh, denominations, uh, uh, all these different things like that are being taught, one saying this, one saying the opposite, back and forth and everything. It, it's really almost like put a cloud between us and God, you know, to be able to see his pure love and see his love and his presence in our life because there's so many things being said uh, for and against almost everything you think of. And I've written six books. My first book, well, I talked about three of them in the last message. And my first book that I wrote back in 2000, well, 2000, yeah, uh, Choosing Faith with Love. It was a combination of subjects that uh, I had uh, used it during the 30 years I was teaching and preaching out of El Reno Federal Prison and other places around town and things like this. Uh, but I wanted to put all these in a book to get the messages out and everything. And um, some of the subjects in the book is like, uh, the reason I say choose faith, because you see, we have to make the choice. Uh, God sends his word and his love to us. And the only positive way to respond to God 
is through accepting his word then into our heart. And when we do that, that's what's called faith. We accept his word to us. If we reject it, it's called unbelief. And like children of Israel, if you reject God's word to unbelief, you know, you got a problem. You might have to go around your mountain another 40 years or something like they did. But now, so I've explained in this book about doubt. Doubt is when you have more than one possibility of something. Uh, seeking, belief, and faith. Healing by faith. Claiming by faith. Uh, Jesus' faith, blood, and resurrection to fulfill the uh, requirements of the Old Testament sacrifices for us and our that we might be forgiven of our sins by just calling out to him any time we choose to. We don't have to wait for a certain time of the year and then hearing God speak eight or ten ways that God spoke to um, people in the scriptures and um, great and precious promises, um, God's love, salvation to all mankind, water baptism, spiritual baptism, all these different subjects are in this one book. Um, so it's like a accumulation of a bunch of different messages and everything that I'd used through those years that I wanted to be able to share with people. Now, after that, well, the Lord started uh, uh, working my life about getting some other messages out. And he showed me then that, uh, well, I covered this book the other day too, that God, that God actually loved Esau. You know, it's being taught in our society that God hated Esau. Uh, because in a statement in Malachi, and there's people called Calvinists that say, well, God hated Esau. He said that, and he actually did hate Esau. But then others say, well, God said that, but he didn't hate Esau. He just meant he preferred, you know, his brother Jacob. And, you know, those are the two divisions in our society. But all of them agree that, you know, in Malachi that it says God hated Esau, but he really didn't. And I show in black and white there where that particular scripture was punctuated wrong. God didn't say he did Esau. He started out in Malachi and he said, I have loved you, yet you say. He was sending an, a message of correction to his children uh, that they've been telling a lie about him. They've been saying that he said he hated Esau, but he didn't. Okay, you check that out. But anyway, in my book, I go, I go through that in black and white and show you in the scriptures that God did never say he hated anybody. Uh, he didn't hate the Pharaoh, hardened the Pharaoh's heart, but he gave him nine times to straighten it. Pharaoh was under the uh, curse of God because the Pharaoh was persecuting the children of Israel. And the promise to Abraham was, I'll bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And he was giving the Pharaoh an opportunity to get out from under that. And then the rest of the book, uh, God Loved Esau, shows that predestination and election is to service, not salvation. There's no such thing as God predestining someone to be born on this earth and die and go to hell and they don't have a choice. That is just a, well, a lie of the devil. I don't care, you know. It's a lie of the devil. You look at my book, I show you black and white. It's impossible, you know, to even consider it a blasphemy against God to think we got a God that would actually let somebody be born on this earth and have no opportunity and die and go off into hell. That's, well, blasphemy is, really sounds terrible. It is. But it's just, it's against God, speaking against God. Anyway, get my book. I can show you in black and white. If you don't believe it, you know, I, you can get your money back. Anyway, it's only about 6 $7. I've set the price as about as low as I can for the publishers um, to publish a book because they want to make some money off of it. And then uh, share it about prayer changes things. So many ministers you're here today say, well, yeah, God, God prayer changes things. You know, we got to pray. But he doesn't change circumstances. He changes a person praying to get you in line with his will. Yes, that happens when you're praying. You get more in line with God's will. But he changes circumstances. Just look throughout. The, I don't see how anybody can read the Bible and come up with the fact that God doesn't change circumstances. They're already predestined and set. Because if you look in the book of Jonah, God sent Jonah, said, set your house in order, you're going to die. I'm going to you know, uh, destroy the whole country in 40 days. Well, the evil king even said, uh, maybe if we turn to the Lord and humble ourselves and everything, maybe he won't destroy us. So they all did. Sackcloth, ashes, prayed, and fasted and everything. And God loved them so much, he didn't destroy them. Made Jonah mad because Jonah said, I knew you were that kind of God. I knew you'd probably forgive him, you know, something like that. Because Jonah didn't like the people. But anyway, 
there's so many changes God made in the scriptures, and he begs people to change. One of the most popular verses in the scripture for our country today and everything is uh, like 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, saying if now, if my people call my name, humble himself, pray, and turn from their wicked way. See, if we will do something, then he says he will respond to us. See, that's not predestined. He says if we make the choice to humble ourselves, pray, turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven, heal our land, and forgive our sins. Now, see, he's waiting on us. So what are the wicked ways? The little wicked ways are we aren't seeking his will. We're failing to forgive people like in Second Chronicles, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11 says, Forgive others lest you give Satan advantage. When, you, when we or you, anybody, fails to forgive someone, they're giving Satan advantage in their life and the devil gets control. Ministers run around saying God's in control of everything, and you know, it, you know He's allowing it to happen. And all this, He's allowing it to happen, yes, because we have made the choice that that's what we want, not knowingly necessarily, but in uh, what is it? First John five nineteen, it says the devil's in control of this world. What in Matthew twenty eight eighteen, it says that Jesus Jesus says I have all power in the heaven and earth and everything. So how's the devil in control? Because like in Second Corinthians two ten eleven, when we fail to forgive people, we're giving the devil control in our life. And look how many people in our country don't even want to have anything to do with God's word, don't want to have anything to do with Christians or Christianity, and uh, they're pushing all the things of God out of our society. See, those people are controlled by the devil and don't even know it. Don't even know it. And many of us Christians are c controlled throughout parts of our days or things like this if we argue and fight and, and you know uh, hold unforgiveness and bitterness and things like this if we aren't walking with the Lord like it said in the scripture you know, he that knoweth do good and doeth not to him is sin there's so many things about it. that's why we have to walk by faith acceptance and obedience to God's word daily then he's in control of our life yes but, it, but if we're just you know, living just like the people of the world and everything like that, well, he's not in control of our life. We've turned our control over to the devil. See, we have to make the choice. Anyway, those are the three books I went over in the previous uh, message. And now I have three other books here. Choose Faith and Grace. Now that's an odd title, but anyway, I'll explain in just a second. Mercy, Grace, and Charity. And that's an odd title too because it has a word on it, charity, that huh, Christianity today is just turned away from charity, but you'll see in a few minutes that we need to turn back to it. But anyway, and then the last book on Jesus. There's so many errors being taught in our society. And one of the first errors is about uh, choosing faith and grace. Now I'm going to play a short blurb here about my website because on my website I have summaries of these six books. I have uh, videos, 18 videos of different messages and I have 20 something blogs messages that I encourage you to go look at. So listen to this about my website and I'll be right back then to uh, get started on Choose Faith and Grace. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Excuse me there, please. I left the mute off and got a little bit of feedback there. But now, the title of my next book I want to share with, like I said, Choose Faith and Grace. This comes because there's so much confusion in our society about grace that I want to clear this up as much as possible. Because grace, like I mentioned earlier, Grace is a word we use to discuss the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Truth, or however you want to refer to God and, and call Him by name. But when He works in our heart in any way, we call that the work of grace. It's always the work of the Spirit in our heart. Now, mercy 
is the work of the Spirit on us or to us. Like in Isaiah 59, 21, God says, this is my covenant with them. He's talking about now with the Old Testament people. It says, my spirit on them and my words in their mouth. Now, God's words are truth. Uh, in uh, John 17, 17, Jesus says, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. And in Psalms 25, 10, it says, mercy and truth are all the ways of the Lord to the people of the Old Testament. Uh, there was no grace in the Old Testament. That's one of the confusions about grace. The reason I want to share in this book, you know, choose faith and grace, that grace is a New Testament word. Jesus is the only person in the Old Testament period before the day of Pentecost that had the Spirit of God, the Spirit of grace in his heart. And he had it from all the way back to conception of Mary when the angel spoke to her God's living word and she received God's living word, the seed of Christ in her heart. There, Jesus had the Spirit ever since then in his heart, the work of grace. Now, nobody else in the Old Testament had that. On the day of Pentecost is when the disciples received the Spirit in their heart. Jesus says, wait and you shall receive power. Well, power didn't mean they were going to get strong muscles and go out and, you know, like Samson and go out and tear things up and beat people up and stuff like this and, you know, be strong physically or something. No, power was in their heart. Christ in their heart. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1.24, uh, the Apostle Paul says, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Christ is a living word of God. Just like spoken to Moses. It says Moses esteemed the riches of Christ greater than all the wealth of Egypt. See, that was, that was Christ in the Old Testament. The living word of God to Moses. He esteemed it greater than all the wealth. And he might could have been the next Pharaoh or something. But um, but he didn't. He, he chose to suffer with his people. Christ, esteeming the riches of Christ greater. See, and when God spoke, let there be light. Christ went forth. See, Christ is a creating, powerful word of God that in the Psalms 138.2, God has exalted his word above all his names. And the reason is because he and his word are the same. Christ is just the manifestation of the living God in our hearts and minds to uh, develop in us what we call a thought or something. From the spirit to the flesh, we have a thought and God has developed that in us. And we say, well, God spoke to us. Well, actually, it was God himself just creating a message in us. But we refer to it as God, his living word, Christ. He sent forth his living word, created the universe. He spoke to Moses. And, and like it says here then, that Psalms, excuse me, Isaiah 59, 21, this is my covenant with them of the Old Testament, my spirit on them, see. But now in the New Testament, it's his spirit still on us, mercy, and it's his word to us. His truth, His word to us, Christ. But then, you know, it's His Spirit in us to create in us a new heart, a new life. Now, that's what the work of grace is. Old Testament, every time, if you look up in the in the, in the books or reference books and things like that, every time the word uh, grace was used in the Old Testament, it should have been mercy or favor. God's love on them, like it says in Isaiah. And, uh, Psalms 25 and his word to them to speak to them that's all they had in their relationship and that's what it says here two times well it says it much more than that but uh, uh, the two times I have here that was a covenant between God and man God didn't like that covenant it says in Hebrews you know that uh, it was faulty God wanted a closer relationship with us so he, prophet, he spoke through the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 36 26 a new heart also will give you a new spirit will I put within you. And not only just put a new heart in us and, you know, like that, and a spirit in us, something like that, uh, separate. He says, A new heart also I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in. He cleans us up, gives us a new heart, and then he comes to live in us. Well, he's living in us when he's doing that, you know, the work of grace. He's creating a new heart and all this cleanness up. But he lives there then. He, he doesn't leave us after he does it. And like in Galatians 4, 6, Because your sons God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore you no more a servant but a son, if a son, then heir of God through Christ. See, that's when we become a child of God. Romans 8, 9 again, Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, it is none of his. That's when we change from being a creature of God to a child of God. 
them. And it's so, so very important because in our society, grace is being taught so terrible, uh, saying, well, God's unmerited favor. That is totally 100% incorrect. Now, I don't have time to explain it to you right here and go through the rest of the books, but get my book and look at it. First thing, grace has nothing to do with favor. Grace has to do with our response when we call out to God and invite Him to come into our heart. Now see, that's what He wants all of us to do. That's not favor. Favor is associated with mercy when guys of the Old Testament you know, did great and everything. God not only met their needs, but He also blessed them with more than their needs. And in um, unmerited favor, it's talked about in what is it, Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Or despise thou the riches and goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. When we were out in a world of sin, and like in Ephesians chapter 2, the first five verses so say that we were fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you know, we were just uh, desires of the heart. And the only thing in our heart was what people had taught us and things, and we choose to do this and choose to do that. Now, see, that was the people of the Old Testament. And God's love on them. But but when we choose to receive Christ into our new into our heart and He creates in us a new heart and puts His Spirit in us, see, He cleans all that up. He forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. First John uh, five nine says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's the work of grace, the cleansing from all unrighteousness. And then we receive his uh, spirit in us to stay in us and that's a work of grace in and that we become a child of God and we eternally then saved or his spirit is in us it's eternal life 41 years ago this day I received his spirit in my heart and he will always be in my heart throughout eternity because, you know, when he comes in, creates in us a new heart, new life, we become a child of God. And there's no provision anywhere in the scripture for us to become a unchild, you know, be kicked out of the family or anything like this. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, talking about, you know, the judgment seat of Christ, it said that uh, if all our works are burned away, we'll be saved as by fire. Now, I don't want it to be anything like that. Now, I can't imagine anybody, you know, receiving that changed heart and changed life and then doing nothing. But he's got good works for us, and he's got a special holy calling for us. And grace comes from us humbling ourselves, inviting his spirit to come into our heart. Christ in us, our hope of glory. I'll be right back in just a couple of minutes. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we're expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org.
K98talk.com, a leader in Internet radio. So grab your seatbelts and take the ride of your life on K98talk.com. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Welcome back. Now, the reason, you know, I I wrote this book about choosing faith and grace is because like in the the statement that most people make about grace is God's unmerited favor, they will say, undeserved, naturally any of God's love is undeserved, but that's not a defining word for grace see because uh, to define a word you you need a description that eliminates all other words it's like a patent lawyer trying to write a patent on something he has to eliminate the description through his description any other possibilities well grace God's unmerited favor favor has to do with Old Testament relationship you know of uh, mercy God's love on and to the people but now when it says unearned, there's nothing you can do and all this, you know, the things they add to it. You know, it sounds so good that it just must be God, but it's not. Not a bit of that description has, is the truth of grace. Grace is not God's unmerited favor. That's his unmerited favor to those that are lost in a dying world, out in sin, rebelling and everything. And, and God forgives us and then welcomes us into his family when we turn to him. But, but that's not result of uh, favor something is for us something we've earned we can't earn grace we can't earn God's salvation but there is something each of us must do now there is something we got to do so you hear grace God's unmerited favor we can't earn it to nothing to do and everything like this well there's a gentleman uh, that teaches daily about grace uh, here on a local one of the radio I mean, TV stations, and uh, he teaches that uh, well, it's so great and all this. He's written twenty something books or more about this, and in one of his most recent books, he has on page ten. Uh, he says, "I have no tips whatsoever of how you receive grace. It just gets you." That's terrible. Somebody teaching, you know, and has written 15 or 20 books on grace and is still writing on grace and teaching every day on grace and not understanding how you receive grace or where you get it from. You get it from humbling yourselves. When, uh, Ephesians 2 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. Through faith. What's faith? When he, God teaches us we're a sinner, we have to accept or reject it. If we accept it, we're accepting it to faith. Then he teaches us for our sins that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So see, once we, he teaches us that Jesus is the answer for our sins and his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, the gospel, Apostle Paul says, uh, once he teaches us that, we have to receive that. If we reject it as our solution, then we can't get saved. So see, it's through faith, our acceptance from God's teaching that we're a sinner, Accepting from his teaching that Jesus is the answer from our sin. And then acceptance of what we must do about it. See, just knowing it is not salvation. Knowing all this good stuff about the Bible, the scripture and thing, is not salvation. 
a head knowledge won't get you to heaven. That's why so many people going that day Jesus is going to say, "Depart from me, you workers of iniquity." I never knew you. Hebrews four two says, "For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it." So once you hear and know and receive the fact, the knowledge in your head that you know you're a sinner, that Jesus is your answer. Your response is what determines whether you become a Christian or not and receive His Spirit in your heart. And the only response acceptable to God is to humble yourself to Him, to humble yourself to His Word. And like it says in Romans, let's see, 10 it says, uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Humble yourself for God. Say, Lord, please forgive me. Send your Spirit. Put your Spirit in my heart. Create in me that new heart. And I surrender my life to you. Now, see, you may not say those exact words. A drunk laying down on the side of the road, something like that, can just cry out, God, or help, or something like this. It's when the heart speaks to God. It's when your heart calls out to Him, warning Him. Uh, you know, the, so there is no perfect little prayer that you need to say, or something like that. But your heart needs to have an honest desire. To turn from sin and to turn to God, like it says in Second Corinthians three sixteen, when it, the heart of man, turns to the Lord, the veil of separation, that veil between God and us, is removed. When the heart of man turns to the Lord, the veil of separation is removed. Now, see, so uh, that's what you've got to do to receive the grace of salvation, to receive the grace, the work of God's Spirit in your heart. That's what the word grace means uh, it's, you know it, it just tells us that when we, we're talking about grace we're talking about God's spirit moving working in a person's heart we talk about mercy it's God's spirit on a person or to a person and then in just a minute we'll be adding charity to that charity then is a, I'll just tell you now charity is a work of God's spirit in a Christian like working in my heart or working in your heart God in us and then we work with God and go and let him work through us to someone else like uh, you get out and get ready to go play golf and something and the Lord says go down there and talk to that neighbor uh, see you got to be cooperative you got to respond you got to respond positively yes Lord I'll go and, and you try to go with the right attitude with love you know instead of rushing off to the golf game you 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 love God enough to want to do what he wants you to do and you love your neighbors enough to want to do what he you need to do for them so when God speaks to you to go down there and um, speak to that neighbor to do something see you got to be cooperative to go in love it's faith that works by love so you accept God's word to go down there and you receive it in faith with good attitude and you know the cheerful heart and everything you go down there and that's faith that works by love that's also what is called the end result of that is what is called charity charity is just another way of saying faith that works by love because see charity is the work of God's spirit in a Christian's heart speaking to them moving his spirit to say and speaking to them saying go down there and visit your neighbor now his love and his work in your heart then gives you that desire that you want to go down there and do what God's asking you to do so you go down there and then that is what's called in that person's life a work of God's charity because it's through a child of God to a another person now the other person could be either a Christian or you know a, a lost person non-Christian because God might be sending you to help edify and to help build up one of his children that's you know having a bad day or something uh, he, he may be sending you to visit with someone who's not a Christian but see it's God and you working together God's asking you to go and then you go with love taking him with you and then the it's work of God and man in the work of charity. And I think that's why the devil had charity taken out of all of our Bibles and everything like that, because that is one of the most beautiful pictures. You know, in fact, it says, in the, if you look up the word charity in the King James, like one of them says, charity is the end of the law. You're loving God with all your heart, and you're loving your neighbor with all your heart. It's the end of the law when you're letting God work through you like that. And it, it's so much more confusing when... Uh, 
well I hate to say it's more confusing but it's it's not as clear put it that way when you say you know that love is the end of the law sure we know love is in the, the law but when we're talking about charity and say charity is the end of the law it shows us how it's us working with God God working with us and we go together to help someone else see and, and that shows you know such a, a more of a complete picture of God working with his children so it's mercy God's love on us grace God's working in our heart and then when he wants us to go and we let him go with us in the right attitude and love and everything faith that worketh by love then we're going it's charity to the other person and it still should be in our Bibles because it's a much clearer but choose faith and grace there is something you must do there's something I had to do there's something everybody has to do we have to humble ourselves to God's word and we've accepted God's word of faith we have to humble ourselves and invite his spirit to come into our heart he won't come uninvited and so that's what everybody must do to receive Christ in their heart he won't force his way in we've got to do it ourselves so there is a tip a great tip on what you must do to receive grace that's humble yourself to God's word and respond to it according to faith. Hebrews 4.2 said the gospel didn't profit them not being mixed with faith. They didn't humble themselves and then receive the word into their heart that they heard and knew in their head. And that's what each of us have to do. I have a friend that was preaching. He had been preaching for several years. And he was calling people to the altar one night saying, Come, surrender your heart and life to the Lord. And he said a voice spoke to him and said, You've never done that. And he said, whoops, that's right, I haven't. He went right around in front of the uh, pulpit, bowed on his knees, and prayed and received Christ as personal Lord and Savior then. And I'm going to run out of time here trying to get to these other two books, Mercy, Grace, and Charity. Well, I just covered charity. The, the big important part of uh, charity is that, like I said a while ago, it's, it's a joint effort between God and us when we're doing performing an act of charity. It's God working in our heart, a work of grace, his love and everything. And then he speaks to us to go share with someone else. And see, we aren't just going by ourselves. He's going with us. When we're sharing with, to somebody's ears, he's speaking to their heart. And like Jesus says in John 6, 45, They shall all be taught of God, every man therefore that heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. But he uses us as his mouthpiece sometime to talk to their ears and then while he talks to their heart. If we're sharing the true testimony, and that's why we as ambassadors cannot change his word. Proverbs 35 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure, a shield them, put their trust in him. Add thou not to it, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. If you start sharing with a person something that's not God's word, he's not going to be speaking their heart to, you know, uh, back up what you're saying. And when those people try to, you know, go by what you say, he's not going to back up what they do either. He's not going to back up your words to them. We've got to be as ambassadors trying to share God's pure word to a person. And I know that if you call out to the Lord with an honest heart, he'll do the same to you that he did to me. He'll create in you the new heart, a new life, and completely change you. Now, so that's all I'll mention about the book, Mercy, Grace, and Charity. It's just an extension of grace, God's spirit in us, working in us, and through us to others. And only Christians can perform the works of charity in the scripture in the scripturally using the word correctly now a lot of people you know give things to people and feed people and do this that's great that's that's good acts of, of you know community and you know fellowship and things like this but charity is only the spirit of God working in a Christian through a Christian to someone else to edify and build them up in the Lord now Jesus my last book it seemed odd to write about Jesus so many books about Jesus and everything but there's so many things in our society being taught incorrectly about Jesus one of the first things I want to share with you just a summary here of the first part of my book about the Trinity the Trinity is not that complicated it's not that difficult and so many people say you know just uh, we just have to uh, believe it because the Bible says so or something like this no take a look at uh, either well get a copy of my book and read it or you can get a Bible out and read chapters about 40 to 50 in uh, the Old Testament where it talks about Joseph the Trinity is a spiritual relationship that in the Old Testament is described here by Joseph 
you know, who was the youngest son of uh, Jacob at that time, and the other brothers, you know, got mad at him and everything and sold him off to slavery in Egypt. And then um, God used some dreams to get him before the Pharaoh, and then the Pharaoh saw his wisdom, and, and God gave him the interpretation of dreams. And the Pharaoh exalted him to the second highest position in Egypt. And when he did, he said, you'll rule by your word. Everybody will live. They'll ever, everybody, you know, uh, they'll pick up their feet and put them down by your word and everything. You know, he had complete control over everything in Egypt except for the Pharaoh. Now, that was a physical trinity there because the uh, Pharaoh said, you shall rule by your word. Your spoken word. Now, it didn't matter whether he sent out a, a written word or, you know, sent out a, 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 he went up there and spoke to him. Just however people received his word, that was a rule throughout Egypt. Now, compare this then. In the physical relationship between Joseph and the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh willed, but he turned it all of the operation and speaking up front to the people to Joseph. The Pharaoh willed. Joseph performed the Pharaoh's will through his word. His spoken word uh, went forth across the land of Egypt. And people had to obey Joseph's spoken word, however they received it. From, you know. Now, so it was the Pharaoh backed off, gave Joseph the upfront speaking position and operating the kingdom through his word. His word went forth alive to the people. They lived by his word. Now, in the Trinity, the f spiritual Trinity, okay, the Father wills. The Father has exalted Jesus not to just be our uh, mediator, but the Father loved Jesus so much, he exalted Jesus through the position of being a mediator for us to a position of fullness with the Godhead bodily. Jesus is fully God now. God, it pleased God to do that. He chose to do it. So God exalted Jesus now to the fullness of Godhead, and God has stepped back and let Jesus be the upfront speaker. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, the first three verses, that now Jesus is the speaker to us. And he rules God's kingdom. He rules the kingdom of God. By his spoken word, Christ. Christ is a living spoken word. We call out to Jesus for salvation. He sends his word, Christ, into our heart. See? So that's a trinity. God the Father has backed off. He's spoken a couple of times. He spoke on the Mount of Transfiguration when he said, you know, this is my son, you know, I'm well pleased. And he spoke with the, at the uh, baptism of Jesus. But see, that's the way the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh backed off. And he spoke only a couple of times too. At uh, one time, when during the famine, people came to him, they wanted food. He said, "Go to Joseph, do what he says." Well, you know, we're told to go to Jesus and do what he says when we want our salvation, you know, from a spiritual salvation. Well, they wanted their salvation of food, and the Pharaoh says, "Go to Joseph, do what he says." God says, "Go to Jesus, do what he says," and what he says is that we must humble ourselves and call out to him for salvation and then he will respond by sending his spirit by sending his word to us the spirit of Christ into our hearts see so the the trinity is just God the father giving Jesus the upfront speaking position and his speaking spoken words are Christ Christ to us and you got to know the difference now between Christ and Jesus to understand so much of the new testament like for an example you hear you'll see it everywhere in Christmas, you see, Easter and all this. Christ died for us. Christ did this. No, he didn't. Christ, the living spoken word, did not die. That God and his word are the same. Jesus died for us. Jesus died for us on the cross right before Jesus died. Um, now, he had the spirit of Christ in him from conception, even, you know, to Mary's conception. Uh, the Spirit of God, His Word, His living Word in Him all His life until He got right to the end of His life on the cross. A memory he cried out, My God, my God, why has Thou forsaken me? That's when the Spirit of Christ left Him. And then He, the man, was left alone on the cross. And, and you look through the Scripture and you'll see, it was a man Jesus 
that died for us on the cross. The man Jesus, because of his perfect walk of faith, and his uh, shedding of his, seven, his blood seven times on the cross for us, the sprinkling of his blood talked about in First Peter. And also, see, he did this for us as the man Jesus. That's why God was so pleased with him that he exalted him to be more than a mediator, but God exalted him to be the fullness of God, fullness of the Godhead bodily to become that. Now, uh, let me read you a couple of them. I'm about to run out of time here. Um, here Peter was talking to the Sanhedrin, and he says in um, Acts chapter 2 in his message to the Sanhedrin, he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, the man whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. See, God exalted him, the man Jesus, to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And that same Jesus then that sends his spirit, Christ, to us, Christ comes into our heart. His spoken living word creates in us a new heart, a new life and everything. And like Romans 8 9 says, Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See, Christ and Jesus were very different until Jesus was exalted to the fullness of Godhead bodily. And now we say Jesus Christ, we just mean, you know, Jesus Christ, the same God. <coughs> but like in Hebrews where it says, uh, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That should have just been Christ because Christ is the same, the same living word that spoke, God spoke to Moses, the same living word that God used to create the universe, the same Christ, the living word of God that he sends into our heart, creating us. See, Christ has always been the same, the living word of God. But Jesus hasn't been. Jesus was born a man from Mary as a son of David, and he was born you know, uh, with the Spirit of Christ in him, from Christ being the seed of God, talked about in Galatians. So, he's like us as Christians today, or we were like him. See, I have Christ in my heart, but yet I'm a man. And that's the way Jesus was when he was here. But then Christ left his heart right before he died, and he fulfilled the position then in like the Old Testament sacrifices of the scapegoat that took, our, took their sins away. When, when Christ left his heart, Jesus was hanging on that cross in the man Jesus, total separation of his heart from God. He had never experienced it before. That's why he cried out with such pain and agony and everything like it. Oh, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? But during that time, he then took our sins. We never have to have that separation from God. That's when he took the sins, the separation of his heart from God for all of us. When I die, this physical death, my spirit will just go and be with the Lord. There won't be any interruption at all. We don't have to have that separation. Jesus took that separation for us. We never have to face that sin, that separation from God again. From the time we're born into the family of God, we have eternal life at that instant. I've already had eternal life for the last 41 years, and I'll continue to have it for the rest of eternity. But anyway, some of these other verses here real quick, because I'm running out of time for this. But there's so many things in here that are being taught wrong in our society. You need to know. And uh, now you can get it out of your Bible like I did too, you know, if you want to take 25, 30, 40 years to, you know, accumulate all of them and everything. Or you can just buy my little book for about seven bucks. Like I said, I set them down to price as cheap as I could because I want to get this message out. People need to know because you need to know about your salvation. Okay, let me ask you. How many people have you told about the Lord in the last week and tried to pray with them for salvation? Or the last month? Or the last year? Probably the reason you don't is because you don't understand really what you have if you are a Christian and how to explain it to them because of all the confusion being taught in our society. Well, just get my little books and it'll show you clearly how to share with someone about the changed heart and changed life and that's what's important because Jesus says you must be born again you've got to be born of the spirit into the body of Christ and because your son's got to send forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying Abba Father wherefore you no more a servant but a son if a son and heir of God through Christ we become a child of God when we humble ourselves and invite his spirit to come into us now in Hebrews chapter 10 uh, verses 10 and 12, it says, By which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Now, see, it should have been offering the body of Jesus. Because Christ is the living word of God. And, and God doesn't have a body, but, you know, it was Jesus, his body. And then, but this man, Jesus, 
But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. See, this man Jesus, it says, not, not God. God didn't come down here. And, how could God can't die? You know, and you'll hear so many people saying that God came down and died for us, and you know, he just he suffered. And no, he didn't. No, he didn't. Now, God suffered because of what he allowed his son to go through. All that suffering, he let Jesus go through and everything. And Jesus had a perfect walk of faith and all this. But it says in there that he was so pleased because of that. That's why he exalted him to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And um, Philippians 2 it says, Wherefore God all who has highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him a name above every name, that is the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. It says, Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, see, Christ already was Lord. But Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, it glorifies God. It glorified him to do that because he was so pleased with Jesus and his willingness to suffer. And uh, for you and me, you know, he set it up. He looked beyond the cross when he was out there in Gethsemane praying and saw what, you know, was going to happen in our lives, how we were going to be changed to become children of God, too, because of what he was doing and what he was going to do on the cross. And like this, in fulfilling those requirements of all those sacrifices for us and everything, he saw beyond the cross with a joy beyond the cross. He said, not my will, but thine be done. Let this cup pass from me. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, and uh, Apostle Paul points this out too. There was kind of a problem with that the fact that he was going to be exalted to a mediator. So there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. See, he says the man, Christ Jesus. He could have just said Jesus because it was Jesus, the man, that was going to be exalted to the mediator. But then in Galatians 3.20, Paul says, you know, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. See, he's saying we got kind of a concern here because, you know, Jesus is not going to be a mediator anymore because he's God now. And he said, uh, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So see, he's pointing out that Jesus had, it had, been intended for him to be our mediator between God and us. But God just was so pleased, you'll see in there. In fact, it says in one place, I don't have it right here now, it said he was so pleased he didn't even allow his flesh to be destroyed. Now, I don't know where his flesh is today. The Bible don't say anything. But it does say that God was so pleased that he didn't even allow Jesus' flesh to be destroyed. Now, that's how pleased he was that Jesus walked a perfect walk of faith shed his blood on the cross, and as much as the devil tried to get him to uh, argue a fight or something, he was arrested illegally, he was you know, tried illegally and all this stuff, and, and Jesus didn't argue back. Philippians 2.14 says, do all things without complaining or arguing. He didn't argue back or anything. He just left his situation in his father's hands, and God was so pleased with him that he didn't break down in sin that he exalted him to the fullness of Godhead bodily and not just to be our mediator. Now, there's so many things being taught wrong in our society. Please get some of my books and pass them out to your friends or do something. And help. Let's get things changed around and get the pure word of God going out so that God will back up our Christian community and deliver us from what's going on in this country, this onslaught of the devil through the Muslims, through the ACLU and all these other things. And uh, I'm out of time now. We said, well, the first part of our program today was kind of chopped up, and uh, the timing is off on the, the message. It would have ended at that point, but I want to reread some of the scriptures about uh, Jesus and how he was man exalted even through the position of, of our mediator, being our mediator between us and God to the fullness of God to fill in this last four or five minutes that uh, we got offset because of the beginning of the broadcast today. In, uh, let's see the first one here. In Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 7, it says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, 
speaking of Jesus, and how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. See, that was what he was being exalted to and intention was, which was established upon better promises. And then it goes on to say, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Then we go to uh, verses in speaking of mediator in Hebrews 9, 15 through 16. The scripture says, And for this cause he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the tester. Now in Hebrews 10, it says, By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. See, the body now, they should have been saying, of Jesus. Today we say Jesus Christ because Jesus and Christ are the same. But until Jesus died on the cross, they were different. Jesus, the man, died on the cross. The Spirit of Christ left him right before he died. And then Jesus, as I mentioned earlier, took our sins as our scapegoat away. We don't ever have to have that separation again. Said so this in verse 12, this man Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Then in Acts chapter 2, it says that, uh, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus the man whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. See, now this is above the position of being a mediator that we, you know, that he was in, uh, intended to be before. Uh, God was so pleased with him and everything that he decided to exalt him to the fullness of Godhead body. But see here, it says God has made this same Jesus, man, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, see, made him, gave him equality. Now, the next one then, verse 4, uh, here it says in Acts chapter 5, verses 30 to 32, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew or, and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be prince and savior, see, the savior, to give repentance to Israel, forgiveness of sins. See, that's, that's God being able to forgive now. We are his witness of these things. So is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. But see, to for God to raise him up to be prince and a savior to, for us, for forgiveness of our sins, that's equality with God. And then in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, but starting verse 9, it says, Wherefore God has also highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him the name above every name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. It said, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus and God, are, you know, uh, Christ are the same now. But it was only after his resurrection and the exaltation to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, good day, and God bless you. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. For past programs of God's Pure Word of Faith, go to www.spreaker.com. That's Spreaker. S P R E A K E R dot com. In the search box at the top of the page, enter my name, Richard Harden, H A R D I N, and click on it. A picture with a cross and God's pure word of faith, Richard Harden, will show up. Click on the picture of the cross. A listing of all the past programs will then show up. 
God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network.